Wow, um, she is also a presenter of the coming Pastel Live. Um, this is busy. This is exciting. And we thank you here for being with us. Most heart. Thanks, heart Thank You're you. Well. you okay. Well, I thought I would just put together this PowerPoint. Um, uh, it's kind of a takeoff on some of the PowerPoints I've shown in my workshops. And uh, so I revised those and I thought I'd just talk a little bit about abstractions and then I'm going to show a short video on like how I get started on a pastel, um, the beginning stages, and then I have a demonstration in the back that I'm going to work on. So that's my plan. So next. Okay. So, you know, really, you know, a lot of people will tell me, oh, I love your abstract florals. But I say, well, I didn't do any florals for probably, I didn't draw a flower for 20 years. And it was only after really delving into abstraction, going from being a realistic artist to then being an abstract artist for probably at least uh, 10 years that then I started wondering about flowers. But I love abstract. Um, to me, it's a shift in focus. You're looking at the same thing, but you're looking at it in a different way. And it can be, you know, very challenging, especially to people who are new to abstract because there's not a specific roadmap on how to get from even where an idea maybe comes from and then how to make that abstract. So I think that abstraction is a combination of you know, internal stuff, your personal experience that you combine with your technique in pastel or painting, the materials, elements of art are just as important in the abstract, I think, and that will hopefully express your own individual unique vision of whatever subject or non-objective. I think abstract is a state of mind. I already said that before, but these are just a couple of quotes that also were in my book with one of the recent non-objective abstracts that I've done recently that's on a piece of um, 30 by 44 inch paper. So um, abstraction is real, probably more real than nature. I prefer to see with eyes closed. Um, and abstraction demands more from me than realism. Instead of reproducing something outside of me, now I go inward and use everything I've learned thus far in my life. Well, you know, for me, the abstraction for me was that was true because I was to the point um, where all I was doing with realism was copying photographs. And I knew I was not being very unique. You know, I just could, personally couldn't let go of what I saw in the photograph. So for me, that quote is true. But for other people who work realistically, it is not. So my journey to abstraction, like I said, um, you know, from early on, I was a realistic artist. Early on in college in the 70s, you know, I've been around for a while. I uh, focused on drawing the figure. I would spend six hours in a life drawing class when I was at the University of Iowa. And uh, I did a lot of portraits and I did some portrait commissions. But after college was finished and um, I went to work because I really wasn't sure how to be go about being an actual artist. So I went to work and um, that's when I started really depending on photographs. Um, and so I became very frustrated with that to the point where I, um, you know, decided one day that I would just cut them up in a pile 
And that's what I did out of frustration, feeling stuck. What is it I really want to do as an, an artist? If I could do anything, what would it be? And I went back to thinking about the one of the earlier inspirations for me, which was Franz Klein and Georgia O'Keeffe. They seem like totally, completely different, but I do remember seeing them on a college visit to the uh, Art Institute of Chicago. I loved Franz Klein and those huge black and white bold paintings, but I loved Georgia O'Keeffe, especially when she would look closely at an object like flowers and abstracted that flower or music. So abstract art for me became the first thing that I went to in a gallery. So that's when I started to experiment. Okay, so here is an older pastel that I did. And this one came about from my cutting up uh, either a photograph or a drawing that I had done. And I did both. I would, in the beginning, I cut up photographs. They were black and white photos that I took of plants and flowers. And I cut them up and then I started drawing each little section and the section might've only been like one inch by one inch. And I started to think, you know, instead of drawing this whole photograph, why don't I just draw a portion of it? And then that started to teach me about shapes and composition. And then I went from photos to, well, I'm gonna try the same thing with some of the drawings I've done of um, plants and flowers. And so I had a lot of line drawings of leaves and flowers like irises. And I started taking a viewfinder and going around and looking for things. So this uh, abstract pastel that was on some Wallace paper was done from me looking at a portion of a line drawing. So that's how I started. And I did that for the longest time. And um, then I started to diverge from that into things that were semi-realistic. So how to abstract I think is to start where you are at. What are you drawn to? Is it landscape, building, shadows, color, texture, human form, flowers, whatever it is. Uh, study other artists. Don't try to copy, but always ask yourself, what is it about what they are doing that draws me in? And how can I do some of what I like about what they are doing in my own work. Uh, simplify things to essential shapes. I think if it is flowers, you know, thinking about, well, whether it's non-objective, an abstract landscape, an abstract flower, a face, simplifying things down to their essential shapes, I think is really important. I know in the past, I've made a lot of, things I've thrown away. And usually the things I threw away were because they were overly complicated, too much going on. So mm -hmm. abstract from memory. Um, I think that is a good thing to do. Change your focus. Instead of looking at something straight on, look at it from a different direction and bring emotion into play and always ask yourself what if questions, no matter what it is you are painting. I think it's always good to say, well, what if I tried this color or what if I tried putting the underpainting down in a different way or with a different material? And different ways to abstract. This is, you know, again, I'm kind of rehashing that but I will have people who will, you know, um, come on to Patreon, say, uh, and look at my videos. And so it's all brand new to them. And they'll say, but how do you do this? Well, again, back to small sections of things, um, small sections of drawing, small sections of photos, 
creating a work from another work, taking a viewfinder, looking at something you've already done and using that work as inspiration for another one. Intuitive mark making, which is something I do a lot now. And this one is an example of that. This is a recent one I did just, I had no plan. I just put some underpainting down and just started making marks and taking a section of an intuitive work. And then compositional formats like uh, things that you will see, grids, repetition of shapes, layered cruciform, texture, line, color, you know, so many of those things. But I think with say pure abstract, sim keeping it simple is probably the best advice. And what are the benefits of working abstractly? Maybe you don't want to be an abstract artist, but you'd like to uh, you know, combine some techniques into your own work. Well, this is a face I did um, and using the same techniques that I use for non-objective. And I decided to draw a face on the non-objective underpainting that I did. I think that working abstractly helps you to respond more to what is in front of you instead of direct observation. I think direct observation and drawing from observation is really important. I really believe drawing is a, a, a foundation that I rely on, whether it's non-objective or something a little more uh, semi-realistic like this. But it helps you to, instead of let's put that reference photo away, now let's just look at what's in front of me. Um, working abstractly might help you to loosen up your current style, help you approach your work in a different way, bring a new a sense of fun, spontaneity, and energy to your work, but also add a new level of frustration. So I've seen that so much in workshops that I've done. The first day people will come in and be excited. And then the second day, well, frustrated. And then by maybe the third day, okay, okay. I think maybe I'm kind of getting a handle on this. So it's just different for a different uh, stages that we go through. So anyway, loosening up, I think it's important to have an open frame of mind when you're working abstractly, trying to control the outcome will often result in a work that you're not happy with. That's true for me. If I'm really too um, hung up on this visualization I had in the beginning, and I just, this is what I wanna do, sometimes things go a different direction than how you had originally planned them. So there's a delicate balance between having a plan and allowing the work to lead you in another direction. And um, learning to work, I think abstraction uh, is a lot about relying on your intuition, what is inside. And um, instead of thinking, well, now what composition should this be? And where should this, the dark be? And where should the light be? Um, you know, some of those things that are more, you know, analytical thinking sometimes, um, you know, can kind of get in the way. So I just think art is like golf. I use that analogy a lot. We're almost finished with this PowerPoint, but it's like I've taken golf lessons. I love golf. I don't keep score anymore, but I've taken lessons and uh, watched a pro hit a golf ball, sails way up and out and thought, I want to be able to do that. <laughs> but not thinking about how often this person has done this over and over and over. We all know that progress in anything, especially art, takes a lot of just work, work, work. Um, so we can go on to the next one that I've already covered. It's kind of a repetition. 
Uh, this is kind of a repetition also, but this is an example of actually an imaginary bouquet I did. Um, I took a vase that I had at home and I drew part of it. And then I took flower drawings and I just took bits and pieces out of a flower drawing that I had and put them there. So it wasn't a bouquet of flowers that I had, but it was just a combination of things. Um, so my process, here's a non-objective that I did um, maybe last year um, or the year before, whenever. <laughs> I don't remember some, some I'm in a I'm in a blur as far as time goes these days. Um, but I keep a sketchbook. I think it's important to keep a sketchbook. My sketchbooks are uh, coming up with ideas, visualizing possible compositions, even if it's not a realistic drawing of a flower. They might just be little sketches for me to think on paper. Then I decide on a color scheme. What color of a painting do I want to do? Whether it's an objective or a floral. You know, do I want to do a green painting, a blue painting? What color is um, on my mind right now? I choose a format such as, is it going to be a square, a rectangle, horizontal, vertical? I create a loose underpainting on paper, usually with fluid acrylic and usually in just one color. And then after it dries, I draw with compressed charcoal on the underpainting. I've also uh, sent a handout on this whole thing for everybody. So you don't have to you know, write a lot of things down. After I've done that, un that drawing, uh, it might be drawings of flowers. It could be a face. It could be non-objective like this one. Then I apply Liquitex clear gesso with a rough brush or golden ground for pastel, which I don't use very often anymore. Um, I like the Liquitex clear gesso because it's simple and I don't have to dilute it. I choose a range of pastels in my color scheme and I lay them out next to me in the order of dark, medium, and light, because I'm thinking about value. And the underpainting helps me think about value. And I really work loosely in the beginning with broad strokes of color application. Last slide is a floral that I did. You can see the drawings that I did. The flowers mostly were not that color maybe the bleeding hearts a little bit, but everything else was just made up. So then my process is to assess progress and take a different perspective by stopping, taking a photograph, looking at the photograph, thinking, how do I bring this to a conclusion? I look for dominant areas and a quiet area. Here are the dominant areas really are in the middle and the quiet is on the outside. More active mark making and color accents in focal areas. And usually people will say a lot, how do you know when you're finished? That's such a good question and it can be hard to answer, but I always think stop before you think you're finished. You know, don't keep going. Uh, when you don't have an idea of how to bring it to a conclusion, let it sit, let it rest, walk away from it, leave it unfinished because it may be finished. And um, sometimes we, sometimes my best stuff comes about the fastest. And you think, well, how can you do start to finish in two hours and you're done? But most of everything I do is like that. So now, instead of in the beginning, it wasn't. So those are, that's my PowerPoint on what it is that I do and why. And then I put together, this is a 12 minute video and I apologize for 
uh, the white paper in the beginning, but I just was too lazy to film it over again. To well, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the surface that I use and um, what I do to get that ready for a pastel painting. So here on my masonite board, which I've painted black, um, people ask me where I get these and I've had this masonite board for a long time. So I paint on both sides and I've got a larger one and this is one that I painted black. So. Um, so I have a piece of Reeves BFK printmaking paper on this board that I have taped just with masking tape. And actually I like masking tape because I can see through it and then I can see this border. I don't measure it or mark it with the pencil. I just put it on there. So, um, and uh, I should have looked up here I can see where it says Reeves and I actually this is just a test piece but I like to not use that part of the paper so I usually crop that off so I didn't look at that this time around so this is just a practice to show you how I get this ready but it is a sheet of 175 uh, weight paper which is a little lighter than I like but a lot of practice pieces and demonstrations for pastel societies I do on that weight of paper and when I do a finished pastel in my studio then I use either 250 or 280 which is a heavier weight paper but I like the lighter weight paper especially for studies and demonstrations because it dries more quickly. So anyway, so I've got it taped up. The next thing that I do before I start a pastel painting is I decide what the color scheme is going to be and then I choose the underpainting based on the color scheme. Usually for me the underpainting is going to be the same color as the painting. Now some people choose a complementary color say if they are going to do say a landscape painting that has a lot of green they may choose some red, orange, or even hot pink for that underpainting. For me I'm usually choosing uh, the color of an underpainting based on the color I want the painting to be. So and I usually use golden fluid acrylics. In this case I have picked out some really bright orange because I thought it would stand out much better for this video. That's the reason. And uh, or I will choose, let me grab this. Here is a color of ink that I really like and I just got this antelope brown. I really love that color of brown. So I'll use an ink um, other kinds of inks, but usually I will use a fluid acrylic, which you can also use on sanded paper. So the next thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to pick a wide brush. I'm going to put some of that fluid acrylic <clears throat> on a plate. So I put a little bit of the fluid acrylic on the plate. And the other thing that I really think about doing before I put this paint on is I use a wide brush. Here's a wide nylon brush. It's a really smooth brush. And I like to use a wide brush because basically I'm putting on a non-objective underpainting. And it's very quick and I don't even think about what it is I'm doing except I may uh, let me just put one on and then I'll talk about that. That might even be just enough. So I am going to just leave that. I might put a little extra like water. Uh, have some lighter areas.
but that's probably enough for this purpose. What I'm looking for is I want to divide the paper up randomly. It's a random underpainting without thinking, oh, here's where a flower is going to go or here's where a landscape element is going to go. I don't think about that. I think about dividing the paper up and having this color broken up on the surface. We've got a darker area here, kind of a medium area here where there was a lighter layer of paint and then a white open area. So when I draw whatever it is going to be on top of this, I use that underpainting as um, a help in helping me to abstract the subject no matter what it is or a non-objective painting. So that's simple. I'm going to dry that with my hair dryer next because the paper buckles, but the lighter the paper is, the faster it will also dry. So the next thing I'm going to do is dry that with my hair dryer and then I'll proceed on to the next stage. Okay. All right, so I've dried my paper now with my hair dryer, so it's pretty flat and it didn't take long to dry. Now, I could put anything on here that I want. Like I said, I could put uh, flower drawings on here. I could put a face on here. I could put a still life, a landscape. Um, anything that I would want, I could put on that. So I need to think about what is that going to be. Well, let's say, hmm, let me decide whether to just make this into an abstract or um, something a little bit more realistic. But, you know, I think I'm just going to go with abstract, but maybe it might have somewhat of a landscape. I don't do landscapes, but I thought, okay, so here's a couple of sketches I did for, I think, my Patreon site, just trying to use two lines as something uh, simple for a landscape. So, let me just do that along with having something a little bit more non-objective. So let me draw. This is a piece of General's compressed charcoal. So let me just draw in kind of a line this way. And how about another line maybe this way. So I've got these kind of landscapey lines, which probably look more like Iowa than anything else. And then let me just put in some other, some other lines that might go I don't know how this will turn out, but uh, you know, and I could also make some lines with, uh, I'm going to grab a couple more things. I've used that compressed charcoal, but here are, is a hard piece of hard pastel, which I could put in here. A little more mark making. It's not very dark. I think I need a darker one. So let me see what I can find here. Here is a little bit darker. Okay. And Okay, so I draw on that underpainting. Basically is what I'm trying to show you is I draw on it. And then I'm going to apply some clear gesso on top of that. I'm still looking around for a little bit darker piece of orange. Um, that's a little bit better because 
that underpainting was so intense. But it's the, see, it's the underpainting stage that gives me that experimental um, aspect and it helps loosen things up from the very beginning. So now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some Liquitex clear gesso on top of that. So let me get that ready. Okay, so, you know, I, I haven't done a lot of drawing on there, but just enough to really show you what it is that I always do. Now, I have this Liquitex Clear Gesso. I really like it a lot. Um, it's easy to use. I don't have to dilute it. All I do is squirt some of it on a plate. And I always have to be sure that I'm not picking up the wrong bottle because I have matte medium here also. And it's the same bottle, but one's got a blue label and one has green labels. So to be sure I'm using the right one. And then I buy these cheap $1 brushes, bristle brushes at the hardware store. And that is what I use to put on this clear gesso because I put it on in a random way and uh, I don't worry about the charcoal underneath smearing because it really doesn't smear that much, especially if I'm using the General's charcoal. So, and I just randomly put this on, going different directions, just making sure I've got plenty of it on because this is the first layer of a how I do things. And a lot of times I spend more time on this first layer than I do anything because if I get this correct, and this one I can see if I was doing this, you know, again, I would make this much darker, which I can make darker once it dries. So now I'm going to dry this with my hair dryer. And then I'll feel it to make sure I've got enough clear gesso on there. And the reason I use the bristle brush is because I want a rough texture. I don't want a smooth brush. I like to see those brush strokes because the brush strokes actually add to the surface appeal of the finished painting. So I'm going to dry that with my hair dryer. Okay, so there we go. There's my drawing. And uh, what I did on this one is I decided on a green color because I have another pastel in the other room that I've been looking at a lot lately. And it's like, well, I really like that green color. And I just did some green abstracts and so I've had green on my mind. So uh, this is the drawing that I used. This is a drawing that I have done several times and uh, I can brighten that up so you can, no, I guess not, but uh, it is a drawing of day lilies and some hostas that I had in the yard. And so uh, with flowers, I collect a lot of drawings. I draw from life. I either go outside and draw or I bring them inside. And then I save all of these drawings. And here are some tulips and some bleeding hearts that I had in the spring. And so I have a lot of sketchbooks like this that I create drawings on and then I use them later on in different pastels for the pastel florals. And I don't just use one drawing um, many times. I will use more than one. Now here I've added some extra flowers. There was one flower here. Uh, there were two 
Well, I guess there's this one large daylily and you can see it's a line drawing. There's no color. I decided I would just make it whatever color I wanted it to be. And so in this case, it is green. So I put that green underpainting down and I dried it. And then I took my drawing and propped it up on the wall and I redrew what I saw in my drawing on top of the underpainting. So it's the underpainting that has broken up so much of what you see here, which is what I really like about doing a random underpainting is it's an unexpected result and it's not controlled. So in some areas, say right in here, which is probably a day lily that hasn't opened yet, there's part, part of this is green, part is white, there's lines going through, there's some uh, yellow green, and then there's some more green here. And so I like the way that the underpainting breaks up the subject. And so then I will start to go in with some hard pastel first because that is another layer of almost like a thin layer of paint when you're painting to put in some hard pastel and then some soft pastel. So that is my plan here. And uh, like I said, this is my first time. So I'm gonna put a little bit more um, hard pastel on here, and then I will put in some soft pastel. So I've, this is really dark in here, but I put a little bit of hard pastel in there. So I'm going to put a little bit more in some different places. And sometimes I will draw in some extra uh, shapes also. But I always figure, you know, with the underpainting, I also think it doesn't really matter if I mess something up too badly because I'm just going to paint over it anyway. So, because it's just a layer of things. So, and that's kind of how I feel about the um, putting in the hard pastel is I'm just putting a little bit in and uh, I'm, I can paint over it. And the other thing I, I do think about as I'm going along is where are the darks and where are the lights? There's going to be light on the outside and here is going to be the darkest area. I have also laid out my pastels here that are next to me. And I do have an assortment of browns, olives, greens, oranges, and some neutral colors that I'm going to use. Now, I have no idea if this is going to turn out well or not. I hope it does, but you never know. So you can all like just maybe get up and come back an hour later and see what happens. <laughs> I can see the lines and the thing that I try not to do um, with a pastel is I try not to color in the lines. Now, I wanted to show you this also. Here's where I tested out my colors on this paper towel when I picked them out. So that's what I did. And I, 
that is something that I do frequently is test out the colors on a paper towel like that. And it also helps me clean off the colors um, as I'm picking them out. So I'm gonna put that off to the side. That's a great idea. And that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not one of those that um, I know there are people that are really great about cleaning off their pastels. Um, I just clean them off on a paper towel. So I'm thinking as I'm looking at that, a color I didn't pick out, but one that I think I need now as I'm looking is I think I want some kind of a blue, a dark, dark blue. Yeah, that's what Letty so. was asking about. She said, how closely do you stick to the colors you've chosen? And therefore you, you see that you need this dark blue, right? <laughs> Right, right. And that may not be quite the color I was thinking about, but it's, um, you know, I've got uh, plenty of pastels sitting out here. So I'm just thinking I really, there's a lot of dark, warm browns in here, but I'm thinking a blue would be really nice in here. Mm -hmm. And I also think about uh, flowers as just abstracts. Um, to me, it's an abstract first and a flower second. Right. For me, flowers are really an excuse to go back and draw from observation, which is something that I have been missing um, because I love to draw. And um, the reason I draw flowers is because it's much easier than trying to find a live model to draw from where I live. So that is why I started to draw flowers. Louisa wants to know how you choose your palette for each painting. Do you have, like you say, inspiration or you decide on green or blue or whatever? Yep, yep. So this one really was, um, I want to do a green painting, like the one I have in the other room. I really just want to do another green flower painting with some green lines. So, uh, so usually what I think about in the beginning is what color's been on my mind, what color has caught my attention and it may be a color I've seen uh, in nature if it's a flower or it may be a color that I've just been drawn to recently. So that's kind of where it comes from. I'm going to put it in some of the lighter colors in the background, I think, and get some of these areas to maybe stand out a little bit more. I'll put in some neutrals. Um, you know, another thing that I will say on colors, and that's not quite the color I was thinking of. This might be closer a little bit. Because I, I am thinking when I picked out these colors, I did think, well, complementary color to greens is going to be red. And so I didn't pick out really bright reds, but I picked out some more neutral reds. Like this is more, I would imagine it's a kind of a flesh color or kind of a light burnt sienna. And um, so I think about complementary colors and I think about values and I think about a contrast, dark and light. I don't want to make the background all one color. I want to vary that. And so I've looked for some different uh, variations on value and the type of color that I could put in the background. 
so many things to think about. Um, and I also uh, always work standing up so I can move back and forth. Um, hopefully, yes. And I think I'm going to need not to add some other, you know, I'm standing off to the side here. So, but that's starting to make that stand out a little bit more. And now as I look at that, I'm thinking another color I didn't pick out, but would be some light gray. So, um, probably I'm thinking that because this kind of a light red, um, I want something a little cooler to maybe cool that down a little. And so maybe I will pull some of this um, blue or this gray over some of that sienna. Um, I want a variation in that background. So now I think I can go back in to some of these flower shapes and start putting in some other colors. And so I usually use the side of the pastel first. Um, and then we'll go back in. Because I'm always seeing now other colors I should have picked out. It's a good thing they're here. So I can just grab them. You know, sometimes at a workshop, you think, oh, I didn't bring that color with me. But I am thinking about analogous colors, not just all greens, but let's put some blue in there too and have you know variations in those colors variations in the kind of green let's get some you know really bright green but not overdo it let's get some olive in there um where can i put that let's get some light green but then also some blue so I'm going to be popping back over, it looks like, for a little bit of blue. And variations in all of those colors, variation in blue, variation in the values of the blue, not the same kind of blue, not the same value. Okay, and I think we'll go with some pops of that's pretty bright, might be a little too bright, but if I put it down light enough, I know I can go over, go over it. I think it probably even needs to be even a little white instead of such a bright green. Okay, so it's making things move forward, making things stand out. Um, Put a little bit more blue in here with some Giro pastels. And see where else can I put that? Maybe I'll put some here. So, yeah, I just uh, like did the, an interview with one of my friends who is a, a cold wax artist. And we were talking about abstracts and he does a lot of figures in his uh, paintings. But we were saying, you know, that they're abstracts first and then figurative. 
uh, second. So it's kind of having that um, reference there, but not being so tied to it that you say, well, I have to make this look like a flower. Um, sometimes, and I've done that, the more I think, well, I have to make this look like a flower, then I get too tight and um, I'm not being as expressive with it as I, as I could be. When do you decide where your focal point's going to be? Do you do that in your line drawing? Well, I probably do that as I move along. Uh -huh. And I'm going to start thinking about that here pretty soon. Um, where is that going to be? And how am I going to do that? And uh, how... Am I going to make that? How am I going to make that happen? I have got some oranges here that I have not used. So I think that is probably something I need to do. And I don't want to overwork this, but I do want to add a little of that uh, color in there. And maybe I will add I know that when I drew this, there were some daylily um, stems that went up. So, and if I put that there, where else can I put that? There's a lot of these cool colors, so I need to have some warmer colors, but I think, you know, the focal area for this whole thing is going to be in the middle. So there's going to be more mark making in that area than there's going to be on the outside. So that's really kind of what I'm thinking. And to make something stand out, say so right in here, we really can't see that that's a flower shape. So how can I make that stand out a little more? It might be that I might need a line here and there. And maybe it's, you know, that rust colored line, or it could be a blue line also. I do like the addition of some of this blue. I think it's a good uh, addition of a color. So, and some of the things that I drew before I've kind of lost, but, and I'm not sure where the, exactly this flower goes, but I don't mind that it got lost because then I'm not going to be tempted to make every petal stand out. Um, I'll be able to kind of just let that go and be a little more abstracted with it. So it's a Always, you know, stepping back and how can I make something stand out? How can I push something back? How can I bring something forward? And that's what I'm looking at right now. So I picked out a lot of, I think I need some different greens in here. Maybe this one. And I need to do a little more over here, which the um, webcam, webcam's in my way. <laughs> I 
I think I want to put a few more lines, um, maybe with some different color also. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> maybe I will put, I like these really, really neutral colors a lot with those Giro pastels. Um, that's something that I think about a lot, uh, more than I did, a, you know, quite a long time ago, I realized that even working with abstracts, that neutrals were so important and I really needed to find a way to figure out how to use them. I never quite knew how to use neutrals with abstracts, but I think about that. Pastels have allowed me have taught me so much more about color than um, other paints. You know, I mean, I do both. I paint with acrylics and I work with pastels and each one teaches me something about the other one that I can use. So right now, as I am looking, I just really love this area right in here. This is like my favorite area. Now, how can I do that in some other places where there's some of that line and maybe it is some of that blue that I put down. So I think maybe, maybe I will put a few more lines here and it might be that I might just um, kind of redraw some of these lines that I already have in this section because I really like those blue lines right there. And I think it needs a little bit more of that. I like that a lot. So, hmm. Sometimes it's things that you didn't plan on doing and you think, oh, I really like how that looks. I need to do that other places. And so right now, you know, I was doing a lot of just laying in blocks of color, but right now I feel like I need to put some line in. And it's really thinking about these things being more shapes and areas of color than anything else. So that area down there, I think I might want I think about flowers too as um, just kind of a loose representation of a flower um, and not really trying to be too literal with it. So when I look at this, once I get this finished, um, I, I just, I want to think, oh, I love the colors in that oh, there's some flowers in it too. So I want the flowers to be almost uh, secondary to, that might be a little light there. But again, just kind of thinking about some neutrals.
you know, and I, I'm probably going to work pretty fast on a lot of this stuff. This is this is what it happens with me. I, I, I mean, I naturally work pretty fast on almost everything. So especially when I'm like listening to the Rolling Stones or something like that, then I really get going. I'm kind of liking some of the things in there. And okay, that isn't as green, that's more of a blue, but I don't mind that. That's kind of a nice contrast to all of that green. Okay. I think you're all still out there. <laughs> I hope. Yes, I think everybody's just been watching. <laughs> we haven't gotten to okay. questions or chats, but okay. Like, what is what is she doing? I love this color of green that I'm putting down right now. Whatever that is, it is just like bright, 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 green. I don't have any in here, but maybe. Uh, yeah, it's, it's more just really wanting to I have something that um, is, um, like I said, when, if somebody looks at it and they'll say, oh, I like that green painting. Oh, I think there's flowers in it instead of it being so um, obvious. Some things that I do, are more obvious than others. Now, I think I might need kind of a, uh, some warmer lines over here. And uh, and maybe I need some of that dark blue still in the middle of that, or sometimes it's even, maybe I need to go back in with black lines. So, and I also get to the point and I can look at my drawing down there and say, okay, maybe some of the lines are gone. Well, I could go back in here and I can put a few more lines down that maybe I lost. Yes, Letty asked us uh, that you mentioned new pastels and Gerald. Uh, what others are your favorite type of pastels? Do you have other favorites? Um, well, right here, I have, um, you know, I use most of the time, I use unisons. And um, Unison's, and I have some Giro and some Mount Vision. I like Mount Vision because they're large, and I like the large, you know, shapes of Mount Vision. And also, I like the Townsend. I like the, you know, my goal is to buy more of these because I really like to be able to finish something up with Townsend's. Um, I like to make line with the Giro pastels. I very rarely use them as pastels that I will block things in, but I use them a lot for line. And I like the Townsends because 
to me, it's like putting that final icing on the cake that uh, they're just so creamy and thick and I love the shape of them, but I need more of them. So that's my goal is to order some more of those. You know, this pastel, um, let me flip back over to a different, let me go this face. Okay. Sure. And let me like bring this in a little closer. I'm in a really small space at home. So, um, so right now with this one, this is to the point, usually what I do um, on my own is I have to take a step back and I have to look at it, which I usually do by taking a photograph of it and thinking, okay, what stands out? What doesn't stand out? Uh, is there too much of something? Um, how can I bring this to a conclusion? What about the background? You know, as I'm looking at the image in the monitor here, I think I want the background. Now, I really like this, oops, this right over here. It's like out of the whole pastel right now, this is still like my favorite part down here because of the neutral. So I really like that area. It may be that there's part of the flower that just doesn't stand out enough. And so what can I do to make parts of that flower uh, stand out a little bit more? It may be that I need some lighter, brighter colors and even looking at it in uh, the monitor, that even helped a little bit. What if I was to put that? up there. Okay, that's kind of making that stand out a little bit better. Get Maybe a little I'll more move. movement into the rest of the painting by doing that. Right. So it's, you know, it's just trying to bring, I don't want to make every single petal look right. like a petal. Right. You know, I want an indication of a petal. Just that did uh, maybe enough. Um, so it needed a little bit more of some lighter colors. And I might need a little bit more of that. And if I put this color and the other color that I had, uh, which was this one, if I put it here, well, where else can I put it besides right here? And I don't want to overwork this. Um, I want to treat it all in here equally instead of, oh, I'm really just going to pick away at this and get this. You know, I really want to maybe just leave that alone. And where else can I maybe move? some of this warmer color, even just little spots of it, maybe a line. Maybe a little up here. Um, I just want to move that color around and so for my opinion on this one for me right now it's like okay this one could be 75 percent of the way finished but I need to this is what I normally do is take a back back up take a photograph of it think about you know where is this going to go how can I bring this to a conclusion and sometimes I've but recently started using uh, Procreate. Uh, this year I invested in all these Apple products. 
you know. So, uh, but I'll, I will do that. I will take a picture with an iPad, use Procreate. I kind of make some adjustments on it, um, no matter what it is I'm working on, and then think, okay, now I can go back in and fix that. So, you know, maybe on this one, as I'm looking, maybe there's too much green. Um, the one I have in the other room has is pretty much all green, um, but maybe this one has got too much green. Um, so that's how I go about doing everything. I've also pulled out, I don't know where we're at time-wise, but I've uh, pulled out some other finished pastels that I thought I would show you of other subjects. Wow. So how about that? And then we can have question uh, answer. It looks like. That's great. Do whatever. Here it's, okay. Here it's 1222. So, okay. I'm going to move this back and wipe off my hands here and go switch back over to the um, webcam. All right, so now let me uh, put up some other pieces that I've done. Now, some of these that I'm gonna show you, I have done for Patreon videos. So this is one where I did another face. This is, uh, I had some red paint and some blue paint, and that was my underpainting. You can see where the blue paint, where the red paint is. And I've drawn this face multiple times. It was a picture I took of my sister way back. And uh, I just like experimenting with it. And I love the way it turned out. Um, to be able to just abstract that face with color and letting the color break up the, the face. And um, I've drawn a lot of portraits in my life. So I, I like reverting back to that. And um, I like how this one turned out quite a bit. You know, a lot of times for me, the underpainting is the key to everything. The underpainting is where it all starts. And if I get that right, um, and it's pretty bold and it's pretty expressive, then the rest of it goes along so much easier. So there's a face. Uh, this is a little out of proportion, but here is a figure that I did. <laughs> And uh, I took one of my old figure drawings from back in the 70s from my life drawing class, and I put it up on the wall, and I did this underpainting in red, and I also have this ink that I really like, an F&W antelope brown ink, and that's what I put down here, and I drew that figure on top of that underpainting, and I really like how it broke up the different areas of the figure and how the figure can kind of move, merge into the background and the background becomes part of the figure. So, you know, if I had time, one of these days, maybe middle of winter, I'll join the, uh, the New Orleans um, drawing group that Sandra Burchell organizes. I'd like to try some more figures. Um, and then here is a landscape that I recently did that, and this one is sold, so I don't want to get the back dirty, but I did this one for, and there's a part of this is on a YouTube video. Um, I took a portion of a photograph from Rocky Mountain National Park that I took of um, 
Uh, it was a stream with boulders and grasses and I was there in October. And so I took this photograph and I took a portion of it, cropped it, and then I uh, changed it to black and white. If I use a photo it, at all, it's a black and white photo because I just want to make up my own color. And so I picked out just some colors of different blues, rusts, and some purples. And this is just my interpretation of that uh, uh, stream, Rocky Mountain stream. So this one is going into a bank in Cedar Rapids pretty soon. So, um, because, you know, people will say, well, how do I make an abstract landscape? And I'll say, just simplify it. Make up the color. Um, get it down to its essential elements and eliminate a lot of detail for a landscape. And then, so that's pretty much it. Um, then I had some other smaller florals that I did. And these are examples of, I did four of them at the same time, but um, where I used the same drawing, these are more realistic colors, tulips, bleeding hearts, some leaves. Um, and I took the same drawing, but I took portions of it and uh, used different portions each time and did the drawing, you know, uh, did four different versions. So that, I think that's probably enough to show you. So. That's great, thanks. Uh, if anybody gonna... has a question, you can unmute yourself and, and ask it. At this time, let me get, yep, let me get back to, all righty. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, I didn't hear too much of that, Nicholas. I don't know whether Deborah heard you or not. I said thank you. That was a very nice demonstration. Deb is my first one, so thank you for asking. It's, it's absolutely wonderful the way you've covered everything. Um, and, you know, I have your book and I have your videos, but hey, it's wonderful to see you in action and the way you keep changing and sort of moving your way through is um, exciting to see. And your verbal explanations, I would think would might even be difficult for you to come up with because concentrating on painting takes you away from the verbal and the verbal takes you away from the painting, I'm guessing. What do you think? Yeah, you know, it's, of course it's much different to demonstrate and talk at the same time. Uh, you know, I would say for myself, and even when I do videos, uh, which I've done a lot of videos this past year, um, but I don't videotape everything because um, if I'm working on something that I just really just wanna escape into something without thinking about anything else. And so I have those times where that's just what I do, you know, and I don't show people how I go about doing everything because I can't, yes. um, you know, I can show the process, but like with this behind me, I'll finish it up maybe tomorrow and uh, we'll see where it goes. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. It was very good to see you. You did. Are you, are you planning to be at IAPS next? Uh, you know, the way it looks now, if we're still going through everything, I probably won't. Uh -huh. And I, I won't be teaching. So um, 
I and I don't have any in person workshops scheduled until next summer for um, Hudson River Valley and uh, another one in Connecticut for Artists Rising. So, um, you know, right now I'm going to focus on the online and I am uh, going to be doing, um, I think it's more of a mixed media online workshop for the Winslow Art Center up in Bainbridge Island. And so I'm going to be doing that. And I may put together an uh, abstract floral workshop for just pastel. I'm thinking of doing that for maybe October sometime. So um, I've had a lot of requests from people for that. So if I do that, it'll be, you know, a partially Zoom, um, like what I did here, and then people doing work and submitting it to me for, you know, and doing some Zoom critique meetings. So that's the kind of thing I'm planning on doing, but I apps, I'm still not sure. I was supposed to go to France Oh, yeah. At the same time, because I have work there and it's been postponed um, oh. three times. And I'm not sure <clears throat> about that. So we'll have to wait and see. Well, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. But we have to really be positive about <laughs> moving on. As, oh. But it's so wonderful that you're available through zoom or whatever how it works through right right I, I would like to thank you very much for I thank you so much more questions thank you. Right. 